Back in 2012, when I was 15 years old, my brother bought a PlayStation 3. Now, this was a big deal. Up until then, we only had Nintendo consoles and a shitty PC, which were great, don't get me wrong. But now I witnessed graphics for the first time. One of the first games we got was Assassin's Creed 3, and I was hooked. I never played anything like it. I distinctly remember the first time you got out into the streets, and I thought the level was just, like, that street. But then it kept going, and I could climb the buildings, and I could see an entire city, and I could go there. And the funny thing is, this was the fifth game in the series. Most people were already getting sick of these games. But for me, a whole new world opened. For me, it wasn't a gradual increase in scope and graphics quality. No, no. I went from GTA San Andreas straight to this. My first open world game where people had faces. But I'm not here to talk about Assassin's Creed 3. I'm here to talk about the next Assassin's Creed game I played. Uh, Assassin's Creed? While I liked 3 a lot, I didn't understand anything about it. Looking back, it might be the worst game to start a series with. So of course, I wanted to get me some context and play the first one. I borrowed the game from a friend and played it on the aforementioned shitty PC with mouse and keyboard and had a miserable time. I didn't even understand the story much better because while I didn't know very much about the American Revolutionary War, I didn't know anything about whatever was going on during the Third Crusade. Heck, I never even heard of the Third Crusade before. Or that there's apparently a numbered list of crusades. As a 15 year old Dutch boy who was still learning English, all of this was very confusing. But confusing or not, I played these games a lot and I'm finally starting to see what's going on. So join me in looking back at the one that started it all, Assassin's Creed 2007. Our story starts in the Temple of Solomon with you killing an innocent man. Meet Altair, a Syrian assassin with little patience and a lot of confidence. Along with two fellow assassins, he's here to retrieve the Ark of the Covenant. To accomplish this, he does everything that an assassin is not supposed to do, while Malik keeps pointing out that he's doing the wrong thing. They're not alone though. Enter the Templars. Alter ear is like, his life is mine. But Malik is like, you have already broken two tenets of our creed. Now you would break the third. But then Alter ear is like, I am your superior in both title and ability. You should know better than to question me. <laughs> this guy is so edgy, I can't believe it. Alter ear jumps in, is like, give up, Robert. That's the Templar guy's name. And goes for the attack. However, Malik tries to stop him. Altair trips and gets stuck on the other side of a pile of rubble. Defeated, he returns home to Masyaf on his own. His companion's dead and his task failed. On his way to the castle, he talks to Abbas, a guy who really hates him and who you should try to remember. Then it's time to deliver the bad news to his master and mentor, Al Mualim. He tells him the task has failed and his companions are dead. But it's all the fault of that darn Templar, Robert de Sable. Al Mualim does not take this well. You return to me with nothing but apologies and excuses. But wait, Malik still lives and he retrieved the treasure. He calls out Altair for being an incompetent asshole. Because you would not heed my warning. All of this could have been avoided. But there's a bigger problem. Robert followed them to Masyaf with an army. A little while later, you're standing on top of a tower just to show Robert what a chad you are by diving right off it. Also, it turns out Malik's brother was still alive, but he gets stabbed two seconds later anyway. You drop a bunch of trees on his army and that's that. Still, Altair screwed up big time, so naturally, he's got to get stabbed as punishment. And that's basically the introduction. You're a jerk from a thousand years ago who has to regain his honor. You get booted out of the animus and... Wait, did I talk about that yet? So, if you're not familiar with these games, this might be a little confusing. And if you are familiar with these games, you might have already pointed out that this game does not start in the Temple of Solomon with our boy Altair. 
No, this game starts out with our actual boy, Desmond Miles. He's a bartender. I'm a bartender for Christ's sakes! And very much not an assassin. Not anymore. Desmond was kidnapped by an evil organization called Abstergo Industries and put into the Animus, a device that lets you relive memories of your ancestors. Abstergo wants something that Altair supposedly found and Desmond has to live Altair's life until they get to the point where Altair found the thing that Abstergo wants. If that sounds convoluted, just wait until you try to follow the other 11 games. This is simple stuff. Desmond only meets two people here. Lucy Stillman and Warren Vidic. This guy's great, he's evil as all hell and clearly does not care about anybody's comfort or autonomy. Yet, he also has his motivations. The human race calls out for direction. They want to know why they're here, what they're meant to do. Well, we're going to tell them. And once they understand how to live their lives, everything will be better. He's clearly not the one in charge, is actually happy once things go smoothly. Thinking about it, he might be my favorite character of the bunch. Lucy is pretty alright. She's the one who actually cares about your sanity and well-being and stuff. She does the upkeep for the Animus and watches you when you're in the Animus. I suppose she sees on her screen what we see when we're playing as Altair? I, I don't know, I don't think they've ever shown it. Bit by bit you find out that she's not entirely here by choice either though she claims Vidic has saved her life. About halfway through the game, she tells you about how her university didn't like the subject of her PhD. Neither did the other unis for that matter. Then she got a letter from Vidic, offering her a job on the Animus project. The implication seemed to be that she was safe from poverty and that's why she's indebted to him. Which like, sure, but waiting tables has got to be a better job than her current situation. Then. She talked about how nearing the end of her contract, three colleagues of her dragged her out of bed, hit her and told her she was going to die. Then Vidic came in and told them to go away, and they did. That's the story. That's how he saved her life. Totally doesn't sound, based on even the limited time we spent with the man, like he might have set it up or something. In fact, she already suspected that Abstergo was behind her getting rejected by all those universities, so she'd be desperate enough to join them. But no, this couldn't have been a setup. Doesn't even really matter which of these two events she considers to be Vidic saving her life. It's just a weak argument either way. Overall, I think Lucy as a character is above average for this game, but the bar is not very high. Desmond himself, he's got as little of a personality as possible. He grew up in an assassin commune in the middle of nowhere, but ran away in his teens because he thought his family was just in a weird cult. He got to New York City and worked as a bartender for Christ's sake. until he got kidnapped by Abstergo nine years later. His role is just doing what other people tell him, which is not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, he's a hostage, what's he gonna do? But this will continue to be his role in future games too, even when he's no longer held hostage. I, I don't know. I just wish he had more of an opinion, or belief, or philosophy, or anything. Anyway, after he had to get out of the Animus, Desmond goes to bed with his clothes on, and wakes up with Vidic just staring at him, and gets back into the Animus. We return to Altair, who has survived his stabbing and is given a second chance by Al Mualim. He berates Altair for being such an arrogant jerk, and says he needs to start his training over again to find his inner peace. Then you hear the phrase, Nothing is true and everything is permitted. This phrase lives on in countless sequels, spurring discussions in countless reddit threads. The writers got this straight out of Alamut, a novel written by Vladimir Bartol, and tried to share different interpretations throughout the series. I've never found any of them satisfying, even though Bartol's story offers an explanation that already suits Ubisoft's assassins pretty well. I will talk about Assassin's Creed's relation to Alamut later in the video. You get a short mission where you try to find a rat that helped Robert's army get in, who promptly gets murdered by Al Mualim, and afterwards you hear your real mission. Al Mualim has a list with nine names. Nine men who need to die. And then the game begins for real. I'd argue that there are only three important pieces that make people keep playing these games. 
the gameplay, setting and characters. The characters are least important here. Sure, people are obsessed with this Italian fuckboy and I think Bayek and Cassandra were pretty good too. But apart from them, I don't really care about any of the main characters. The setting, that's what draws people in. The series is known for recreating historical cities, putting the focus on the atmosphere and famous landmarks, so it even feels right when they inevitably have to scale the cities down. When discussing sequels, most people aren't talking about where the story will go, they're hoping they will finally get to go to feudal Japan, or what I'd like to see, the 80 year war. To put it bluntly, people don't come for Arno, they come for the French Revolution. However, the thing that got me hooked in the first place and keeps dragging me back into these games is the gameplay. You can plop me down in an empty swamp and although I hate myself for it, I'll be entertained as long as I can climb some trees. It's the thing that put Assassin's Creed on the map. You can climb anything, give or take. The reason I wanted to make a video before it spiraled out of control was just because of the gameplay and how they kept developing the mechanics throughout the series. Placed next to a game like Odyssey or Valhalla, climbing in the first Assassin's Creed feels extremely bare bones, but put it next to Black Flag, the sixth game in the series, and you can see how the mechanics from the first game are still right there just with a bunch of quality of life improvements slapped onto it. I love how you can see the incremental steps between each game where climbing gets just that much smoother. I think Brotherhood is where it starts being fun, for me, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Altair's abilities can be put in a few categories, combat, climbing and stealth. Regarding combat, he can attack, grab and dodge. Later on you'll unlock the counter and that will get you through the rest of the game to be honest. It doesn't really get much deeper than that. At some point you get throwing knives that insta kill anyone, but that's about it. The combat has some death, but why bother when two buttons do trick? The climbing is a bit more involved, though like I said, still bare bones. The way it works is that you can hang on to most things that look like you can hang on to them. That's a bit fake, I know, but let me show you. This ledge has a sharp corner. Can you hang on to it? Yes. Yeah, you can. This ledge here is quite slanted. Can you hang on to it? No, no you can't. This building has a rim sticking out and a few square holes in it. Well. There's your route. The system works really well, provided that every building has enough rims and holes and windows and such. It can be difficult to find a good route sometimes, especially when you're being chased. Expect a good bit of running up a wall and going nowhere. There isn't a way to quickly climb down either, so they put haystacks next to all the tall buildings into which you can dive, from any height, without taking damage. If you see pigeon shit on the ledge, that's the indicator that there's a haystack below. There's also these viewpoints on tall towers where you can scout the area and reveal intel missions. They're indicated by an eagle and uh, I assume eagle shit? Point is, there's always a haystack to dive into from these. It seems weird that they would use bird poop to signify a haystack, but it honestly works surprisingly well. It both sticks out and blends in with the environment. I think it's leagues better than making everything you can interact with a certain color or pointing an arrow or something. You can also jump from roof to roof, of course. All of this seems very basic now, but back then the movement combined with the kind of open world was what really set it apart from the likes of Prince of Persia or Tomb Raider. I like the climbing, but like I said, the third game is where they really got into the groove in my opinion. The third category I mentioned is a weird one. See, Assassin's Creed is a stealth game. You're meant to sneak around, hide in plain sight and kill your enemies without anyone knowing. The problem is, it don't work. At least not for me. I've never managed to stay sneaky in any of my playthroughs. Infidel! The mechanics are just too bare bones. At least they made up for it by making the enemies really dumb. <laughs> if an enemy sees you, they won't immediately go after you. No, they have to see you for a few seconds. Then they will attack. This gives you a bit more leeway in trying to stay hidden, but it's not enough to save the stealth side of things. You will get in plenty of fights. There's also hiding spots. The haystacks I mentioned earlier are one of them. Another is these little huts, got rooftop gardens, and you can sit on benches. There are also groups of scholars that you can pretend to be part of. 
that's kind of the extent of the stealth mechanics. There's no crouching, no hiding in crowds, definitely no shadows or other use of lighting. You do have your signature hidden blade of course, but gameplay wise that amounts to nothing more than stand behind a guy and stab him. There's also eagle vision, which if you've played a game in the last 15 years you're probably familiar with. The environment goes dark, interesting things such as enemies or hiding spots light up. I think this was one of the first games, if not the first game, to do this, but it's everywhere now, so I think everyone got their own opinion at this point. So there's your gameplay, jumping around the city, fighting people and stabbing guards in the back. What about the repetitive- Alright, alright. The curse of Assassin's Creed, the thing that everybody brings up for good reason, the repetitive missions. See, there's a fourth category of gameplay here, intel gathering. It's the thing you do for the main mission, which is the only mission. I love the concept of these missions. The idea is that in order to kill your targets, you must first find out where they are and come up with a solid plan. You might learn that there's no guard station on a certain roof or which side of a building has the easiest approach. You can also hear people talking about your target, maybe in anger or fear. You observe the actual effects that your targets have on the people. This is all so great and a surprisingly human approach to telling a story. Where they drop the ball though is in the actual missions. For every target there are about 8 missions you can do to get intel on them. In order to get permission to go kill your target you have to complete 3 missions. These missions consist of the following. Eavesdropping, pickpocketing, interrogation and informers. Eavesdropping is pretty simple, you get close enough to the people you want to eavesdrop on without them seeing you. Pickpocketing is similar to eavesdropping, but after the conversation you have to steal something. The person you're stealing from is very unlikely to spot you doing it, so as long as you're out of view from any guards, you're good. Interrogation might be my least favorite type. It's always a guy on the soapbox shouting nice things about your target and then walking away. You follow him to a secluded place, beat him up, and he'll tell you what he knows. To add insult to unnecessary violence, after he's done talking, Altair just stabs the porcel dead and walks away. Not only is this needlessly cruel, it's also one of the broken rules that got Altair in this mess to begin with. In fact, the first thing we saw from Altair was him, in Solomon's temple, killing an innocent guy and getting berated for it. It's not even something that he only does in the beginning, no, no, he will kill every man he first beat up, right till the very end. His coin's not worth my life. A wise decision. I mean, I know it's just a game, but considering this as a real scenario, since the game treats itself so seriously, I cannot comprehend that these people are getting stabbed every single time. They brought it up in the first place, and now they force you to stab every person who says something you don't agree with. I... I may have chosen the wrong franchise to get overly invested in. Stab people you don't agree with is basically the elevator pitch for this series. It's just that they want to be deep so badly, yet they just gloss over the ethics of murder beyond the stay your blade from the innocent thing that they apparently don't even adhere to that strictly. The fourth kind of investigation are the informer missions. These can vary from a fun race across the city, to a specific parkour route in the form of collecting flags, to taking out guards on rooftops. And no, I'm not going to discuss the ethics of killing guards, because then I'd have to talk about every video game and movie ever produced. The informer missions are usually pretty alright, and at the very least are a relieving departure from all the eavesdropping and pickpocketing and interrogating. After you've done 3 missions, you can report your findings at the city's assassin bureau. Important thing is that they have to give their blessing before you can go after your target. And with that, we can talk about the story. For real this time. Being an offshoot of Prince of Persia, you'd think that Assassin's Creed's story had no chance but to be absolutely wild. Especially if you're familiar with the sequels. What might surprise you then, is that there's basically no weird magic for practically the entire game. Instead, it's entirely focused on the man Altair needs to kill, and the impact they have on him. For our first target, Tamir, we ride to Damascus, infiltrating the city by blending in with scholars. We learn from a stolen letter that Tamir is preparing a large shipment of some kind, and, more importantly, 
that the people he works with claim to have many eyes, many ears, and many arms, yes, good for silencing those who say too much. An informer tells us, The Rafiq has asked me to observe the souk that Tamir calls home. There's a group of troublemakers who gather around its southeastern exit. They and the guards do not get along. Find a way to earn their friendship, and they'll surely be of service to you. We also overhear there's a way into Tamir's building through the central courtyard. We report all of this to the bureau leader, and he gives us his blessing to go kill Tamir. We know where to find Tamir, and how to get in. Because there was way more information to be gathered by doing more missions, Altair does somehow know some things that we haven't found out ourselves. It would have been cool if he actually only talked about the things we discovered, but it doesn't bother me that much. We find Tamir in a heated discussion with one of his weapon suppliers. The supplier is late on a shipment, and Tamir is not having it. He completely loses his shit when the supplier says he asked too much of him and just stabs the guy repeatedly for insulting him. When all of this is over, we walk right up to him and officially assassinate our first target. Assassin's Creed doesn't just leave it at that though. No, let me introduce you to what I like to call the deathbed dialogue. Or memory corridor, as the games call it. Whenever he kills a target, Altair will have a little conversation with them. In this case, Tamir talks about being part of a greater whole, implying that Altair is oblivious to the real reason he had been sent after Tamir. Altair is determined that if Tamir is part of a larger group, he will end the lives of all the others as well. Tamir condemns his pride, and with that, speaks his last words. Because we just killed a very important person, an alarm bell sounds throughout the city. We have to return to the assassin bureau to hide, but do so while anonymous. Meaning that we can't be in open conflict or have guards actively looking for us when we want to enter the bureau. This is easy enough and we report back to our bureau leader. He congratulates us, rubs it in that the other assassins don't like Altair and says that Al Mualim probably has more work for us. We tell Al Mualim of all that happened as well as how Tamir claimed to be part of something larger. Al Mualim reveals it's true, saying Significance comes not from a single act but the context within which it is performed, the consequences born of it. Altair is not allowed to learn more of it, but does gain a rank and get some equipment back. Now we can do counter kills, meaning that combat won't really be a challenge anymore. Our next targets are found in Jerusalem and Acre. 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 The game doesn't know how to pronounce it either. Acre. 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 Now, I can talk about all the other guys as in depth as I talked about Tamir, but that would become as repetitive as playing this game is. The gist remains the same, do some investigation, get permission, kill the guy, repeat. I will summarize a bit though, obviously spoilers are following, and though I have been pretty critical of the game so far, I do think the story is the most solid one of the series, and it's worth experiencing it for yourself. The game is also dirt cheap these days, so this is your warning. Our 9 targets turn out to be Tamir, the arms dealer I just talked about, Talal, a slaver who kidnaps homeless people, people with drug addictions and mentally ill people, but claims he does so in order to save them. Garnier de Naplus, a doctor who experiments on the people Talal kidnapped against their will. What little will there was for them to have. He tells Altair that his job has become much more difficult since the assassins took the Peace of Eden from him. Abul Nukud, oh, the merchant king of Damas, richest man in the city, who organized a great feast, where he killed everybody by poisoning the wine. He became a target because he stole money from the citizens and sent it away for some unknown purpose. He doesn't reveal what purpose, but does say something very interesting I will touch on in a bit. Majd Adin, who just likes killing people and is bummed that he can't kill more people now. His organization simply wanted the city of Jerusalem and he simply wanted power. I killed them because I could. Because it was fun. Do you know what it feels like to determine another man's fate? And did you see the way the people cheered? The way they feared me? I was like a god. William of Montferrat, who believes the city of Acre belongs to its people. He took possession of their food to ration it out during the lean times. 
he conscripted people into his service, but... They were not being trained to fight. They were being taught the merits of order and discipline. All of this was to prepare them for the new world. He sounds suspiciously much like a certain professor we know. Everything will be better. Jubayir al-Hakim, who burned books and texts partly because such works are what inspired the Crusades. He calls out Abdayir's hypocrisy because by killing Jubayir, he's doing kind of the same thing. Am I not unlike those precious books you seek to save? A source of knowledge with which you disagree, yet you are rather quick to steal my life. Sibrand, who put up a naval blockade to keep the conquering crusaders at bay. He is very afraid to die because he knows that nothing is awaiting him. It surprises Altair that he does not believe in an afterlife. And our final target is, of course, Robert de Sablé. Literally just learned that there should be an accent aigu there. So it's true then, Robert de Sablé is in Jerusalem. Though there's been a switcheroo. I sense you expected someone else. What sorcery is this? Altair spares Maria's life because she was not her target. Sucks to be all those guys he interrogated, I guess. They're also hooking up in the next game, by the way, because what else would you do with your only named female character? Robert de Sablé turns out to have gone to Arsouf, where he means to convince the Saracen armies and the Crusader armies to work together in destroying the assassins. Why would they do that? Well, we just killed eight important people on both sides, that's why. Luckily, we find Robert in time and try to convince King Richard of England of Robert's betrayal. Richard lets God decide, meaning we have to fight Robert. Of course we win the fight, but when we finally get our heart to heart with the big baddie, a shocking revelation unfolds. Al Mualim has betrayed the assassins. While the story is pretty interesting, with some nice twists and misdirections here and there, I believe that the Templars and the Holy War are not at the center of the experience. I don't think this game is about Altair's journey through Jerusalem, Acre and Damascus. This game is about Altair's emotional growth. Whether or not it's well written is arguable. Personally, I think it can be a bit heavy handed now and then. But for what it is, it's really well done. You see Altair slowly become more compassionate, more aware of the society around him, of the grey areas in life. Nowhere is this as clear as in his conversations with Malik. Yeah, that Malik, who serves as the bureau leader in Jerusalem. In the beginning, Altair is his arrogant jerk self, and Malik absolutely despises him. But slowly they start to understand each other. Altair starts asking for help instead of demanding it. And by the end, they both seem to have deep respect for one another. Funny enough, it seems to be Altair's victims that bring about most of his spiritual change. Each target explains their reasoning and little by little they whittle away at Altair's convictions, who condemns their actions but more often than not feels sympathetic to their intentions. I said I would touch back on Abul Nakut because he says something quite interesting. Is it so different from your own work? You take the lives of men and women, strong in the conviction that their deaths will improve the lots of those left behind. A minor evil for a greater good, we are the same. This is a cliché, but very fitting for Altair's struggles. Altair is constantly condescending to his targets, convinced that he's on the good side, serving the superior cause. But he's got nothing to support this. He kills merely because he is told to do so. His actions are terrible, he murders people. Yet he doesn't even know the intentions behind them. They are not his intentions, he's merely an arm of the body called the Assassin Brotherhood. I'd even say Altair and Abul Nukud are not the same because Abul knows why he does what he does, while Altair puts all his trust and faith in his master Sayyiduna, I mean Al Mualim. One of the big inspirations for Assassin's Creed is the novel Alamut. Written in 1938 as an allegory for Mussolini's fascist regime, Alamut is a wild book to base your video game franchise on. It tells the story of the Dinzari Ismaili state, founded by Hassan ibn Sabah in the late 11th century. Important to note is that, while this novel is a work of fiction, 
Many elements were based on historical accounts. The Ismails are a real people, Hassan was a real person and real assassinations have taken place in his name. I will, however, treat this novel as a work of fiction, mainly because it's unclear where the facts end and the fiction begins. Bartol has gotten his inspiration by Marco Polo's account of the old man on the mountain, which he in turn has acquired orally during his travels along the Silk Road. This means we're possibly four layers of adaptation deep at this point. Bartol is said to have spent about 10 years of research on the historical background of this conflict, but I don't know his sources, and to be honest, fact checking the story of Alamut is simply beyond the scope of this video. So for all intents and purposes, I will treat this story as being fictitious. Also what follows is merely my own interpretation of the story and the philosophy presented, obviously. Two people can read this book and come to very different conclusions. I would recommend reading it for yourself, it's pretty good, if you can stomach some insane racism and sexism here and there. Alamut follows the story and influence of Hassan ibn Sabah, who has spent nearly his entire life studying. He realized that everyone is equally convinced of their own religion being correct, even though they can't all be correct at the same time, and concluded that therefore every religion must be incorrect. This is where the phrase, nothing is true, everything is permitted, comes into play. No single religion is correct, thus, nothing they say should be interpreted as true. There exist no arbiters of our fate, no divine reward or punishment during or after our lives, therefore, everything is permitted. The novel presents the phrase purely as a view on religion, it being an anti-theistic mantra, yet also leans into the irony of Hassan's worldview taking the shape of religious dogma in itself. He tells of how he transcended his personal crisis by devoting himself exclusively to experience, science and what can be perceived by the senses. But this positivism develops into a hyper-rationalism that by excluding the emotional aspects of human experience as irrational and invalid, itself becomes dogmatic. I think this interpretation fits perfectly into Assassin's Creed's narrative. The assassins are never portrayed as being Jewish, Christian, Muslim or part of any other religion. Yet the setting is a literal holy war. They do seem to have unconditional faith in their leader, Al Mualim. While Hassan himself has denounced every religion, he knows that wouldn't vibe with the general population. Instead of sharing his beliefs, he actually weaponizes the dedication that absolute religious faith can muster. It's like the core of his entire plan. He presents himself as a new prophet, claiming to have the key to paradise and the ability to send anyone to and from the gardens of the afterlife. In reality, he prepared beautiful gardens inhabited by harems behind the castle unbeknownst to anyone in his army. His plan is to train an elite troop of warriors, the Fedayeen, and convince them completely and utterly of the truth of the Ismaili faith. This starts with disallowing them from connecting with or even thinking about any part of their life before they enter the castle. They must never show doubt in the teachings of Hassan, known to them only as Sayyiduna, meaning our master, and they never even see the guy initially. Ultimately, a few of them are subjected to the great experiment Hassan had been trying to shape for the past 20 years. They are told that they will be sent to paradise and get drugged with edibles. These edibles are both sleep inducing and very addictive. When they wake up, they are in the beautiful gardens and welcomed by girls who will please them in any way they wish. Writing this feels really nasty by the way, because we're actually talking about like 14 year old girls, often younger. Quite a lot of time is spent on their experience in the gardens, but Bartol did not know how to write female characters. I don't wish to spend more time on these characters than necessary. So most of these Fedayeen return utterly convinced that they had just been to paradise, and the addictive effect of the edibles makes them really want to get back to paradise. You can probably see where this is going. They get tasked to kill specific prominent figures, knowing they will not survive after their attack. This is where it lines up with the assassins in Assassin's Creed. Sort of. Assassin's Creed couldn't have Altair get killed after his first assassination. They wanted to create an adventure, not a series of holidays gone wrong. The game simply ignores the odds of Altair surviving his missions, like he gets assigned 9 targets, remember? 
There's something else that does bug me though, and that's the fact that everybody in the Brotherhood seems to be in on it. In Alamut, Bartol places a lot of emphasis on the deception of Hassan. In fact, the phrase, nothing is true, everything is permitted, and the philosophy behind it, are only revealed to the highest ranking members of his organization. That being like two people. Everyone else is a convinced Muslim, and that is the whole point. In the game, everybody is expected to know the phrase and its meaning, and nobody seems to be religious. Now, I get that Ubisoft wouldn't want to publish a game where you play as a radical Islamic sect going on suicide missions to destabilize a government. It reminds people of certain events, and even Alamut gets read like that sometimes, despite the 60 year time difference. Still, it does make the whole political situation of Assassin's Creed a bit weird, doesn't it? Where did they find all these people willing to give up their religious beliefs? What even is their own belief? Why do they do what they do? All of the sequels just boil those questions down to To stop the Templars! But that's just... So stupid! It's really dumb! In Alamut, the Fedayeen were victims. Even Hassan himself is kind of portrayed as a victim of his own purely rational, reddit atheist, emotions are a weakness beliefs. He's purely driven by ego and revenge, and is willing to deceive anyone in order to get it. The entire order is based on a lie. In Assassin's Creed, the assassins are good, actually. Yes, Al Mualim deceives his followers, but not in a way that implies the entire basis of the Brotherhood is corrupt. By the way, I know that Al Mualim and Hassan ibn Sabah are not supposed to be the same person. Masyaf even gets mentioned at the end of the book as one of the places to spread the order, but it is supposed to be the same order, and Al Mualim is an obvious stand in for Hassan, in my opinion. The way that Al Mualim deceived his followers is the following. Remember the treasure that they were getting from the Temple of Solomon at the beginning of the game? That turns out to be the Apple of Eden. A magical, technically science fiction, but what's the difference, device that he now uses to enslave everyone in Masyaf. The nine people you were sent to kill were his companions when they found the apple. Now that they are dead, nobody knows of the power he wields and he can, I don't know, enslave the world or something. Altair manages to kill him and now the assassins are good again. Also, the people you killed were still pretty awful people, so don't feel bad about them. One person was just bad now, and the good person saved everyone. From the fifth game onwards, they do actually start to portray the assassins and templars in a less black and white way, but somehow manage to make it even more obnoxious. Maybe I'll get to that in a future video. Mm -hmm. Now for some actual fun things they took from the book. The scene where the assassins jumped from a tower in front of Robert's army? It mirrors a scene from Alamut where a Fedai also jumped from a tower to show how loyal and faithful Hassan's followers are. In the book, though, he just splats dead on the ground. Way more of a power move if you ask me. The part where Altair drops trees on Robert's army also feels like it references a scene from the book. Though this one is debatable. The first battle in the novel has Alamut's army distracting a stupidly outnumbering army, while the Fedayeen flank them by surprise and saving the day. Like I said, this one is debatable, but they did remind me of each other. When you head to the gardens behind Masyaf, there are a bunch of women just chilling there, which might be a nod to the enslaved girls in Alamut? What I wish they incorporated from the book? Disguises. Sneaking in through the roof is fine, but the novel went as far as to have them capture an enemy messenger, finding a Fedai who kind of looks like him, and performing surgery on him to make him really look like the messenger. Recreating scars and birthmarks and such, it's, it's amazing. The Assassin's Creed sequels do dabble a bit in disguises here and there, but way too little for my liking. Hmm. I also want to see assassins howling and roaring out of sheer excitement and aggression. It was the one thing that made Suleiman and Yusuf fun. The fight with Al Mualim marks the end of Altair's story in the game. He approaches the Apple of Eden, and it spits out a giant projection of the earth, highlighting certain points. We hear Vidic yell, We've got it! And once again get booted out of the Animus. Vidic is talking to one of his superiors, remaining vague about what we just saw, aside from a supposed new world. 
The man orders for Desmond to be killed. We have what we need. Kill him. But Lucy steps in and argues that they hold him until they're sure to have what they seek. They may need his memories in the future. After they hang up, Vidic yells at Lucy for making him look bad, and they both walk out. However, suddenly Desmond's view shifts to eagle vision, and we see a whole bunch of signs and glyphs across the room. We walk around a little bit and it appears to be blood, and just like that, the game ends in confusion. A nice cliffhanger for the next 11 games. As of yet. Favorite tower was this one. Okay, so, first things first. I have set up a Patreon. I want everything I make to be completely free and accessible and for people to be able to use it for whatever they want. Like the music I made for this video, you can download it, you can put it on your own video, you can remix it, you can just copy it, I really won't mind. If I can help someone out or inspire some creativity, I'll be happy. So if you do wish to support me, Patreon will be the place. Next. After I finished this video, I actually went out to check a little bit of the historical context behind the assassins and I stumbled upon a great article by Frank Bosman. He primarily writes about the game's use of religion. I'll put a link in the description, it's not too long. I'm probably gonna do more videos in the future, still working out some subjects I want to cover, like obvious one would be Assassin's Creed 2, but I'm also thinking about Batman Arkham and the way they treat criminalized people in there. Or maybe just some Dutch culture stuff, like... <coughs> Sinterklaas, or the Dutch royal family, which I am not a fan of, <laughs> stuff like that. Anyway, thank you very much for watching, and well, maybe until next time. Goedjes thuis.